DLC media player, or what many people recognize as the Traffic Cone player, has one of the most wild and varied development histories out of all the stuff that we've talked about here on my channel. The landscape of media players, whether it's video or audio, is packed to the brim with different options out there for each person's personal needs. But none of them really match the colossal impact that VLC had and still does in the modern day. I think it's just one of those rare programs that comes along only once in a while that sort of just does everything and does it right, much like last week's topic, Winamp. It's got integrated subtitles, multiple audio tracks that you can edit individually, and you can even stream torrents to it with a torrent stream URL. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. VLC is one of those programs where you can Google how to do X with VLC Media Player and almost without fail, an answer will be there for you for how to solve your problem with VLC rather than the program not being able to do what you want it to. But this reputation was earned over decades, and VLC wasn't always the powerhouse that it is today. In fact, it had extremely humble beginnings in comparison to its current 3.5 billion downloads in 2023, which is honestly f***ing absurd. So let's get into it. Where did VLC come from, who made it, and how did it become one of the most downloaded programs on planet Earth? You want to go online to buy that hot stock at 18, but by the time you're done clicking out of AOL's pop-up ads, it could be at 20. No thanks. So back in the 90s, computer technology was still kinda sh**. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was definitely impressive for the time and things were advancing quickly, but let's not forget the fact that it could take literally hours to download a single song or video with dial-up. This is where the basis for VLC's existence actually comes in. Some French students attending École Centrale Paris, a science and engineering school in France, were lobbying the administration to upgrade their network. Why, you may ask? Well, they wanted to play Duke Nukem 3D over the network with each other, and it was simply too slow to do that. That is correct. The origins of one of the most popular and beloved programs on Earth started because some college kids wanted to find a way to play Duke Nukem with each other. Anyways, their attempt to lobby the campus admins for an upgrade was unsuccessful, so they did what any clever college kids do and found a way to do it themselves. They struck a deal with a large French broadcasting company, which is mysteriously unnamed everywhere I've tried to find it online. They came up with a cheap solution, use satellite feeds to stream and decode TV signals over their university network using their PCs. To do this, they created a server and a playback app, which ended up being the Videoland client, or VLC for short. For a while, VLC was used exclusively by university students and passed down from graduates to newer students. It stayed like this for almost five years until 2001 when it was released as an open source program under the GNU public license with permission from the headmaster of the university. Nobody really knew the potential of VLC at the time, so it's kind of nuts to think that some college kids who wanted to solve a problem at their university inadvertently created quite possibly one of the most influential and important programs of all time just to play Duke Nukem 3D. Once it was released to the public, a developer from the Netherlands ported VLC over to Mac OS and this was one of the first times that massive swaths of people were exposed to it. Because Mac OS at the time didn't have a built-in DVD player app, people flocked to the program on Macs for this purpose. Shortly after, it would be ported to Windows and also saw major success there as well. And this is where we arrive at why it became so popular so quickly. It was able to do what other programs were not because of its open source philosophy and because it was developed for Linux. A major problem with media players of this era was that they frequently failed to play certain file types without third-party codecs. Windows Media Player, QuickTime Player, and Real Player all had their limitations and were quite finicky when it came to playing certain files. But with VLC being developed on Linux, it didn't have a native codec structure like many Windows and Mac-based programs had, so it could be packaged together with all of the necessary dependencies itself rather than having them downloaded separately on the machine. This is why VLC VLC, no matter what you tried to throw at it, simply just worked and it quickly gained that well-deserved reputation. But who actually made VLC? 
I think it's important to recognize the names involved when we talk about these historical products and programs since the people behind them are just as important as the journey. But it's kind of impossible to just credit a few people with VLC. The team has expanded over the years, and the website page listing all the names is hundreds long due to the open source philosophy. This is one of the reasons I think VLC has succeeded as well. When a company decides to keep their product free and allow a community of people to come together and make something great, generally great things happen. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty of why VLC was different and how an absurd amount of features started to get added over its lifespan. Firstly, it was multi-platform and worked almost flawlessly on whatever machine you ran it on. However, the real genius of its design was the fact that it was modular. It was very easy for people to create plugins and modules to do pretty much anything you wanted, including supporting the newest file formats and codecs so it could continue to play nearly anything that you needed. Seriously, nearly every file format and codec is supported. Just look at this insane list on their Wikipedia page for supported inputs and you'll see what I mean. A common problem I'm sure many people have run into when using a video editor, a photo editor, or a media player is that moment when you're about to dust off an old file and load it up and you cross your fingers praying that it'll open properly and then it gives you an error or doesn't work. But with VLC, that almost never happens. File formats and codecs aren't the only thing that takes advantage of its modular design. You can extract full quality still images from videos and do frame by frame playback with your arrow keys if needed. VLC can even be controlled with a f***ing Wiimote of all things if you really want to. In 2003 though, it propelled the online streaming industry forward by creating the X264 encoder. It was so efficient at streaming with tiny amounts of bandwidth that it was quickly adopted by basically every major internet streaming company including YouTube, Netflix, and Facebook. But things weren't always sunshine and rainbows for the team behind VLC. In fact, there were many times when the project nearly collapsed in on itself. In 2007, the team had shrunk to just three students and the project was so large that it became a nightmare to maintain. This is where VLC became its own thing instead of being tied to the French university and the Videolan organization was founded. They needed to find a way to financially support the project and instead of trying to bundle VLC with third party software or operating systems, they decided to start accepting donations. The other somewhat suspect problem VLC had run into in the past was the fact that their use of CSS decryption tools for DVDs may or may not violate the DMCA. It's somewhat unclear on whether or not this is an actual problem, although VLC does not hold a license to do so, but they've yet to have any legal action taken against them. Since the Videolan organization was founded, they've made VLC function on a crazy amount of platforms including mobile devices, Apple TV, Chrome OS, Windows Phone, and a ton of others. It also works with Chromecast and has 4K and 8K video playback, 360 degree videos, 3D video and audio, and HDR playback. The community involvement is responsible for all these additions with the VLC team being hundreds large at this point. In 2021, they announced a video time capsule program where users could send in videos along with important videos that were made during VLC's development journey. All of these videos would be aboard the first commercial space flight dubbed the Peregrine Mission 1. It was scheduled for departure in 2021, but from what I can tell it was delayed. The company working with NASA called Astrobotic has it scheduled to leave sometime in 2023 and land on the moon where it will find its home forever. This project that VLC is working on sort of sums up perfectly the philosophy behind the program and the company. It was started for fun by some college students and continues to be developed because the people behind it are having fun making it. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.